Hello and welcome to the water climate discussion. Erin, I can now hear the dings, you'll be happy to know. So we've got lots of people coming in. So this year we're discussing radical change. And the radical change that we want to discuss today is the Polluter Pays Plus. So we are recording this roundtable. Uh, so please keep your cameras off and your mics muted until you're asked to speak. And if you don't want to be included in the recording, then just keep them off and add uh, read me to the start of any comments or questions that you post so that we know to read them out rather than asking you to share your camera and ask in person. Anyway, uh, OECD established the Polluter Pays principle five years before I was born, way back in 1972. So it's not exactly radical today, but the way we implement it can be. And that's why we've set up this event as a roundtable meeting rather than a webinar because we want everyone's input on this. Today's roundtable is brought to you by the IWA Specialist Group on Sustainability in the Water Sector. Um, I should say at this point, actually, that if you can't see a blue bit at the bottom of my screen that says Inspiring Change, um, then if you'd like to full screen, then you can hopefully see it. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, so you can join the, the specialist group by scanning this QR code. Um, and Erin, could you possibly pop the link in the chat um, too for people to join if they wish? So this group's goal is for all water use to consider not only economics, but also social and environmental issues and future generations, as well as our current co-residents on the planet. Specifically, our climate working group is responsible for this particular meeting, and we brainstormed a number of radical change topics back on the 7th of June. So there was non-potable water, non-liquid sewerage, sponge cities, bendy rivers, geoengineering, uh, polluter pays plus, and uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism equivalents. Uh, as you can tell, we couldn't think of a catchy title for that one, but anyway. Um, then litigation, uh, which is is proving more and more successful at the moment. Um, and finally, deadlines, which was like, are we going too fast or are we actually going too slow? Are we not taking people with us? But anyway, we decided that the Polluter Pays Plus was going to be the best topic for us for today. Um, and so that's what we're, we're dealing with. But the water climate discussion is, of course, a much bigger initiative. We started this year with a launch video on LinkedIn, asking for people to think and post ideas for radical change. And Jo Burgess was the first one uh, on the 14th of June. She brought a post on marine cloud brightening. And I think it's safe to say that Jo considers it to be a dangerous idea, uh, but it might be something that we're forced to consider. Pierce Clark then posted his suggestion on composting toilets two days later, and it generated an awful lot of discussion. Um, I think that if we were starting from scratch, we probably should go for composting toilets. But the mere suggestion caused heated debate, uh, which is exactly what we're looking for here with radical change topics. My proposal that we take longer baths and dream up climate change solutions was a bit more frivolous, but still generated a good number of views. So please do head to waterclimatediscussion.com. Um, you can snap this QR code um, and get there if you like. Um, Erin, could you also pop IWA's URL uh, in the chat for that? Um, you can sign up there for other roundtables and there's detailed instructions uh, on how you can also post your suggestion for radical change. Anyway, I think I have probably waffled. Oh, people are still coming in, so maybe I haven't waffled enough. Do I need to waffle more? No, you probably don't want me waffling more. Anyway, um, let's just get on with the agenda. Um, so we are here. Uh, the intro and poll. Uh, we'll get to the poll very shortly. Um, we're going to, yeah, the polls are mainly actually for Carlos's benefit um, because he volunteered to write up this event for a newsletter and they give him some nice graphs, basically. Um, then we have three wonderful speakers. Uh, they'll only be presenting for about five minutes each. So they're more here to get your creative juices flowing and start the ideation process rather than to present any finished ideas, even though some of them do have some pretty, pretty amazing finished ideas. Um, so first, we have Cynthia from Ana, uh, the regulator in Brazil. She's going to talk us through some regulatory changes that they've been making. Um, 
And when she first started to describe the regulatory changes, I was thinking, oh, that doesn't sound that radical. Sounds like the modern formula. But wait, wait for it. You'll see. Um, it's uh, it's pretty impressive what she's got. Uh, then there's Tom uh, from Anybio, uh, IWA UK and British Water. He's going to be topic talking about river water quality monitoring. Um, and again, just reinforcing that this is a roundtable. I'm not going to be giving big bombastic intros for any of these speakers. Um, and yeah, if you want to get in touch with them, you can. There are links in the sign up page. I hope they're fixed now. Uh, anyway, there's a QR code here if you can't remember what the sign up page was. Um, Erin, if you could possibly pop that in the in the chat as well, that'd be brilliant. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of introductions, I'm Martin, by the way. Um, so Zamina sends her apologies. She's been called to an urgent Congress meeting. Uh, so next up, we'll have Ben from Vermont Public Interest Research Group, who's actually managing to get big oil to pay for their climate pollution. So that's pretty cool. Um, then we'll launch another poll to decide which of these topics we want to kick off the debate with. And then we'll really get into the actual discussion. So please do at any point in this, um, post your thoughts, questions, suggestions in the Q&A, uh, just as soon as they come to you. Um, please do stick to the topic of polluter pays plus for now. Um, so just polluter pays, ways to get polluters to pay for stuff. Um, if you want to propose other ideas for radical change, I'll explain how you can do that at the end. Um, and we are recording this roundtable, so please keep your cameras off and your mics muted until you're asked to speak. And if you don't want to be included in the recording, then keep them off and add the words, read me, to the start of any comments or questions that you post so that we know to read them out ourselves rather than asking you to share your camera and ask in person. Um, Okay, so what we're going to do then is rotate round our panellists, with each of them picking the next question, comment or suggestion for us to discuss. And uh, if you haven't added the phrase read me to the start of your question, comment or suggestion, then they'll ask you to turn on your camera, unmute your mic and raise that question, comment or suggestion yourself. Um, then if you, if somebody has, has just done that and you want to respond, uh, that's the point at which you put up your hand in the um, in the the thing um, in the Zoom interface. I think it's under React, isn't it? Um, is it under React? Oh dear! I should yes, yeah. If you press the React heart thing, then you get raise hand just above that. If you're using the same system as me, anyway. Um, so that's if we're on one of those little discussions that you want to react immediately to that. Raise your hand, and then we'll ask you to you to uh, bring your your point then. Uh, so please do try and keep those responses as quick, in fact, all the responses as quick and concise as you can so that we've got time to cover as many suggestions as possible. Uh, finally, if there's time, I'll try to do a little wrap up and our final poll before explaining the next steps and what to do with other suggestions for radical change beyond the polluter pays plus topic. So we should all be done in around uh, 80 minutes from now. So let's crack on with this intro poll. Um, Aaron, can we have the intro poll? There it is, yes, cool. Uh, so entry poll. On climate issues, do you think the water sector is going too fast? Uh, do you think it's leading the world? Do you think it's going as fast as funding permits or is it going too slow? You can pick multiple options. So you can say that it's leading the world, but it's still going too slow. Um, or you can say it's uh, going too fast and leading the world, or it's going as fast as funding permits, but it's going too slow, etc. cetera. Um, I think I've got to put my answers in before I get to see anything. So I'm going to vote now as well. Okay, and I'm not seeing anything. So um, let's see, hopefully Erin will let us know once we've got most people responded to the poll. I heard a chimey thing, what did that mean? It was a different chimey thing to the usual chimey thing. I don't know.
Uh -huh, there we go. So we have got the uh, responses. A majority, 64% think we're going too slow. 36% um, think we're going as fast as funding per permits. 14% think we are think that we're going too fast. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, so with that, I'm now delighted to hand over to Cynthia for our first five minutes of inspiration. How are you doing, Cynthia? Hello. Hi. Thank you, Martin. I, I would like to thank the opportunity to share a little bit our work in Brazil. Can you see my presentation? I can, yes, perfect. Okay. So I will talk a little bit what we are doing in Brazil. Uh, just to just to start uh, who we, we are. Ana is the National Water and Sanitation Agency in Brazil. It was created in 2000 and responsible for implementing the National Water Resource Policy at federal level. And in 2020, we, we had a big change uh, in our legal framework by law. And it highly expanded on its competency, incorporating the role of standardizing regulation of water and sanitation services and establishing these standard guidelines for the sector. It's important to say that uh, the federal government has no jurisdiction over the provision or regulation of water and sanitation services since the beginning. And now we, we are just establishing these standard guidelines because the, the competency is mostly from the municipality. So it's, it's something that happens in the international level. So, Although having incorporating these competencies, these are national guidelines for the subnational regulatory agencies, which we have more than a hundred. So we have more than a hundred subnational regulatory agencies. And these standard guidelines uh, for the regulation are not mandatory and should be transposed into regulations by these subnational regulatory agencies. So to incentivize them to adopt the standard guidelines. The federal government uses what we call uh, its spending powers. So the municipality will only have access to federal funding for water and sanitation services if they choose a regulatory agency who adopted these guidelines. Just to explain a little bit more the difference between the national and subnational regulatory agency. So the subnational regulatory agency, the provision of, as I said, the provision of water and sanitation services is responsibility of the municipality. The regulatory activities carried out by local, municipal, and intermunicipal or state agencies who monitor the performance or the provision, the service provision. And now we have over 100 subnational regulatory agencies to monitor more than 3,000 operators in Brazil. We have 5,570 municipalities, and they, they, they do not have all uh, regulatory agency yet, agencies yet. So these agencies developed various rules to monitor the service provision. And because of this numerous regulation for water and sanitation to Brazil, lead to a high operational cost to this to the utilities which provide the, provide the services to different parts in the country. This is why now the National Water and Sanitation Agency received this competency for establishing the national standard guidelines for these subnational regulatory agencies. We standardize regulation for all kinds of regulatory Teams, we, 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 as quality and efficient tariff regulations, since economic regulation and technical regulations, and jumping in the polluter phase plus, uh, I would like to explain what we are doing regarding to this, this issue. So this new reform brought this new responsibility for users and utilities 
And one of these changes is related to availability of the services. So now the infrastructure, if the infrastructure is available, the user, the user should connect to it. Wherever the users are connected or not, they all pay a tariff for the availability of the system. It's not the availability availability of the water. They are if even if they are not consuming the water or throwing out sewage, they have to pay for the availability of the city, the system. So however users that are not connected should pay uh, the tariff plus a fine. Uh, and the point is discouraging practice that could harm the environment or public health. Uh, this works especially for sewage connection connections considering the environmental damage and works for water connections considering public health problems. Because in the last one in Brazil, we have to verify the quality of the water that for human consumption and the user should receive the water from the system. So the law brought this obligation and since uh, the infrastructure is available, the user has until one year to connect. So the subnational regulatory agency or the municipality should supervise the user to guarantee this connection. So this is how we are implementing the polluter praise plus considering that it's uh it's a, a important mechanism to incentivize the user connecting to the system that's Thanks. all my five minutes excellent thanks cynthia so that's yeah uh, uh getting people to pay to not connect is uh is brilliant now let's hear from tom there you go can you hear me okay yes i can okay can you see my screen i can see yes there we go oh, fabulous uh so uh i'm not going to spend too long introducing myself because we can talk about that later if you like but i'm a, a water quality specialist um, I live up in the Peak District. Um, we have a rewilding program going on here, uh, the Wild Peak Initiative, where the goal is to rewild 10,000 hectares. Uh, I also work um, in the drinking water industry across the, the globe. So there's a lot of crossover there between me and the others. Okay. We all know our goal is to get to the SDG6, clean water and sanitation, uh, improve the river water qualities uh, and we all know the problems that we're having increased rainfall um and industrial pollution algal blooms from our farming runoff uh, and increasing nutrients uh, in our rivers and i'm going to talk about that particularly we all know the solutions to this uh, uh, our blue green infrastructure so we're not going to discuss that today uh, but the solutions are out there the question is who pays? And this is uh, the, the political bit, and this is the, the bit about radical ideas. Um, so there's a couple of court cases that have gone on to try and decide within our current regulatory system uh, to who pays. Um, most notably here on the right, Manchester, where I'm based, um, where there is an ongoing court case between the Manchester Ship Canal Company, and this is uh, the canal that's pictured here, uh, and the local utilities, uh, which is also a private company. So this is two private companies battling out in court. Um, the local utility is discharging treated uh, sewage, but sometimes untreated sewage via its combined sewer overflows into the ship canal and affecting the water quality there. Um, this is causing problems for the ship canal on meeting their regulatory goals on water quality. Um, and there's a battle to who's responsible. United Utilities say that the system is designed that way and that this is allowable. And the ship canal say they sh that their water is being fouled and this is a form of trespass and damage being done to them. And United Utilities should pay the bill. Um, this has gone to the Supreme Court uh, and the water company has been told uh, by the Supreme Court that um, their business model is based on breaching standard duties, um, but the battle is ongoing. There is the, the challenge here. 
Then in Des Moines, in, in the USA, uh, on the left here, um, there's been a secondary case that has since uh, kind of collapsed uh, along the way where the private drinking water utility in the city of Des Moines, Iowa, was suing the farmers uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the um, the p- people providing the fertilizer by proxy um, for the nitrates in the river. Uh, and this meant that Des Moines Waterworks had to pay for an upgrade on their drinking water treatment plant of $80 million. Uh, and they suggested that the farmers should foot that bill. Um, it caused quite a fuss in, in Iowa. Um, and at one point, the state looked at renationalizing the private utility um, because they didn't like the private utility taking uh, the farmers to court. Um, but the one thing that did come out of it uh, was the need for more data uh, and the need for a, a push onto the farmers to stop uh, the pollution in the river. Um, so we have a problem. Uh, we have the data collecting systems out there, Earth Observation, uh, and tech nowadays to real-time floating monitors for nitrates and phosphates, grab samples for COD. All of this can be put on your digital tech platform. So we have the information to do this. It's not an information gap. It's a political gap of who pays. And my suggestion is monitoring markets. Um, in the UK, uh, we have 124,000 miles of rivers uh, with gauging stations uh, for flows and levels, but not for water quality. Uh, we have uh, almost double the amount of roads with 7,000 speed cameras that's collecting money every single day, uh, 245,000 last year uh, in speed uh, fines directly from the people causing the problem. Uh, we also have uh, about 7 million CCTV uh, TV, uh, systems monitoring our every move. So why are we not applying this to farmers and industry along the way? Um, why do we not have trading zones uh, across a catchment uh, that allows for farmers to pay for their releases, uh, but to make sure that their catchment is improving? Why do we not allow businesses or councils to issue fines directly to farmers, to industry, anyone we catch speeding, um, anyone we catch committing uh, an offence of polluting our rivers, uh, and set up a market where we can recover the costs uh, directly for the infrastructure in there. And my question to you guys is, is this the way to go? Should we set up markets with real-time monitors as the single truth and the point of truth uh, based on what's going on in the catchment? And then we can fund in a circular economy way the restoration of the catchment as well as the pollution of the catchment. I think that's probably my five minutes, Martin. And I need to find the unmute button really rapidly and say yes. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so our final set piece, um, please welcome Ben. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, and huge uh, thank you to IWA uh, for having me and you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Ben Edgley Walsh. I run the climate program at the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Hold on, I'm trying to move into slideshow mode here, um, which is uh, the largest uh, progressive advocacy organization in the state of Vermont uh, over here uh, in the United States. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, Vermont's Climate Superfund Act, which was passed and became law earlier this year. Uh, this is a picture of uh, downtown Montpelier. Normally, it, it doesn't have canals, it has roads, uh, but this was uh, J July of 2023. Uh, when we had some of the worst flooding uh, in the history of the state, um, very uh, similar to what's happening across the southern United States right now with uh, Hurricane Helene, though thankfully uh, far less loss of life here in Vermont. Um, the brick building 
just above and to the left of the M and uh, make big oil pay uh, in this slide is our office building. We lost about a third of our office space, um, but counted ourselves really quite lucky because there were 4,000 homeowners and over 800 businesses uh, that, and most of them lost far more than we did in this flooding. Um, so just a tiny bit about Vermont, we're one of the smallest states in the United States by both uh, geography and population. If you've heard of us uh, outside the country, it's probably because of Senator Bernie Sanders or maybe Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which was founded uh, here in Vermont and most of it's still made here. Uh, we have a Republican governor and Democratic legislature, which if you know anything about the states is fairly uncommon, that sort of split control. So obviously we're here today to talk about uh, the polluters pay principle. You can articulate that a lot of different ways. This is how we think about it. It's if you make a mess, you clean it up. This is a core value most of us learned in kindergarten. My daughter's six, she's in fact in kindergarten. This logo is on t-shirts that we've made. She can read it and she basically understands what this campaign is about. It's also a core principle of the environmental movement. And here in the United States, it's the basis for our national Superfund law, which is about getting corporations to pay to clean up toxic waste sites and other uh, state and federal laws that have withstood industry legal challenges for decades. So this is this kind of idea of applying this polluters pay principle to the climate crisis has been floated at the federal level. It has not moved at the federal level here in the United States. We, uh, in the US, we have this concept of states being the laboratories of democracy, the places that good ideas can go to get started before they ultimately spread to other, uh, other states or to the national level. Um, and so that's exactly what's trying to happen here. A number of states have introduced a uh, bill uh, and Vermont was the first to pass and uh, get enacted uh, this kind of law. New York uh, has also passed it. It's awaiting their governor's uh, signature. So what exactly is this? Uh, this is again, modeled on this national Superfund program, which is in the toxic chemical sort of space, but applying that idea to the climate space. It's based on what's called a strict liability standard, which essentially says this is not about companies having malice or even negligence, but merely that they took an action that caused substantial costs to entities, in this case, Vermont and its residents and you know, uh, other uh, entities in the state. And so therefore, because they took actions that caused costs, they should have to pay their fair share for those costs. Uh, so this law uh, would apply to fossil fuel companies that have created more than a billion metric tons of carbon pollution over the last 30 years. Uh, the cost recovery demands, the you know essentially what we would be saying, you owe us this much money, would be proportional to their pollution over that 30 year period. And money would actually start coming into the state as early as uh, late 2027, early 2028. I should note, we expect this to be challenged uh, in the courts. We believe we have a very strong legal case, but of course we don't know uh, ultimately what the courts are gonna decide about that. Uh, just a little bit more before I wrap on exactly how this works. The first step is the state needs to adopt what's called a resilience implementation strategy, essentially a prioritized plan for climate resilience investments that we need to make as a state. Step two, our state treasurer is responsible for estimating the cost of the climate crisis and these particular missions to the state of Vermont. Step three, uh, our agency of natural resources is responsible for determining uh, how much each company covered uh, is responsible for paying the state uh, for their share of the climate crisis. And then they would issue those cost recovery demands. And then of course, ultimately the idea is money would come into the state and then ultimately would be put into a fund that would be used for adaptation, resilience, and response to the climate crisis. This isn't about cutting carbon pollution. We have a lot of great ideas about cutting carbon pollution, some of which we've gotten past, other which we're working to get past. This is really about the other side of the, the coin while we're trying to cut carbon pollution. We also need to make sure that these companies are paying their fair share because Vermonters simply cannot shoulder the financial burden of the climate crisis on their own just like residents of every other jurisdiction in the world, these companies should have to pay. Um, and we've actually you know, gotten a lot of traction uh, on this around the world. We've seen media coverage in more than half a dozen different countries, done presentations like this to a lot of different audiences. And we hope this is a idea that um, and, you know, will spread around the world. Looking forward to talking to you about it today.
Well, that's amazing. Well done. Thanks, Ben. Um, so, could we have our next poll, please, Erin? In this poll, we're going to be deciding what we want to talk about first. So, yeah, which proposal should we discuss first? Uh, again, you can pick more than one if you wish. Um, so, first option is charging more if not connected to sewerage. Uh, the second is river water quality monitoring, basically all the stuff that Tom was discussing. And the third was making big oil pay. Um, okay, so cast your votes now. There we go, yay. Um, so yes, top one there is river quality monitoring. Um, so Tom, you're going to want to unmute, I think. And... Let's see, has anyone posted, I don't think they have, but you've probably been looking more closely. Has anyone posted any questions yet or suggestions or comments or anything on river quality monitoring? I haven't seen any, uh, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, the audience or even our uh, fellow presenters have um, on this suggestion. In that case, it's just the first to put your hand up then. Um, so to put your hand up, I think you click the love heart with React because you love Tom. And then just above that, you get an option to raise your hand. I'm going to see if it works. Hey, my hand's up. Any other hands? Or am I actually going to ask the first question? Oh. Oh, Cecilia. Cecilia as well. That's yeah. Cecilia, do you want to um on on what do you call it? Turn on your camera and um unmute yourself and go for it. What would you like to say? Hi. Hi Martin, hi Tom. And what about the safety of the devices that you propose, the safety of the cameras? Because I have seen in the TV that people is attacking the cameras in the UK that controlling, I mean, the drivers and others. And you the countryside maybe is not easy to control how it's working and it is damaged for somebody or what else. Uh, uh, of course, there's there's always challenges around uh, vandalism uh, and people damaging uh, the, the the sensors, um, and uh, uh, all these things need need maintenance as as you go along. But uh, a lot of the technology now uh, are, are floating boy type platforms that can be in the middle of the river, away from the general public, where you would have to get a boat to to go and vandalize it. Um, or um, with some of those examples, some of those technologies are little handheld sensors that are attached to your mobile phone that people can run samples on, uh, and that can go into a huge data project um, that are all GPS located, uh, where you can get millions and millions of samples from around the world all to fit into your models uh, and into your platforms. Thank you. Yeah. And in uh, when it comes to air quality, we have similar things across our cities. Uh, I think uh, certainly in the United States and in the UK, there are air quality monitoring stations um, testing for things and linking into satellite data as well uh, that will give us more information. Dan, you have a, a question. I do. Thanks, um, um, Tom. So... Um, I think my question is more around um, standards when it comes to river quality data, um, as well as understanding um, uh, issues around baseline um, river qual water quality data on which uh, I assume the proposals that the, the difference in that uh, base between the baseline and what's observed is what would um, uh, be penalized if I can put it that way. Um, so has, has uh, what strides have been made in that aspect to kind of uh, put a system together where, where there's um, some penalties and incentives? Um, and then what about uh, issues around like uh, the assim assimilative capacity of the environment? So, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the environment can assimilate some amount of pollution 
So how is that, uh, how would one um, allow for that? Yeah, the environment can assimilate uh, um, forms of pollution, but uh, uh, that's why you set baselines uh, and uh, you want your baseline uh, to be set and a constant improving system. So as you start to do restoration projects within the catchment, you will see that uh, improve as long as there's not uh, large amounts of additional pollution being added to that uh, point. Um the, the tests that are available now, um, they're at uh, PPB levels and equivalent to lab technologies. Um, so I, I don't see there being uh, much uh, problems with that. And if you have very cheap tests, you run them into the millions of tests uh, and take an average across that, that piece to get a a better adjusted machine learning set of information, uh, whereas you can, uh, on the opposite end of the tree, have a very high quality, high resolution uh, bit of equipment uh, in the in the catchment that would give you lab based quality data. Um, the the goal is that to have a number that everybody is working towards uh, and working uh, together to try to improve the whole catchment. Um, Rather than at the moment, what we have is uh, a situation where a utility will go, it's the farmers, and the farmer will go, it's the utility, uh, and the industry will go, it's not us, it's the guys upstream. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what you need is is some real data that everybody can agree uh, is valid, uh, and you can all work towards bringing down the levels and improving the situation. Um, we're even getting real-time eDNA sensors uh, coming to market now uh, that can give you biodiversity information on what's going on in real time in the catchment. And again, with our biodiversity goals, um, as uh, as they come in uh, around the COP agreement on biodiversity, uh, that's a, a real-time baseline number and an improvement number that everybody can work towards. Um, and rather than be, hey, we're at number, uh, you know, seven, and we're, we're trying to get numbers. As long as the trend is overall an improving trend, uh, we're, we're going in the right direction, right? Mm. Uh, and then is 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 the uh, uh, the fines that are uh, uh, accrued or um, um, gathered? What would what would uh, how would that uh, be distributed? Is there going to be like a fund like what um, Ben spoke about? Is that the yeah. idea? Yeah. So so the idea around this is that uh, you have both sides of the fund. One is you're doing your restoration project in the catchment uh, to improve the catchment. And you can prove then because the data is going in the right direction that your restoration project is adding value. Okay. Um, and you'll be able to claim from the fund uh, according to the value that you're adding uh, to the catchment. So it gives a financial incentive for restoration uh, because you can prove your your add value. Uh, and then uh, on, on the other end of the scale, um, you know, the, the money is going in according to what you're doing. You're completing a circular economy view uh, where you might say, actually, it doesn't show me much financial value in, in fitting an expensive end of pipe action here. But if I fund X amount of um, direct work in another part of the catchment, uh, I can add value in that way uh, and uh, um, be part of that circular economy uh, to show improvement. Um, the the, the key is creating a, a market uh, and with a market driver rather than a, uh, an individual blame driver, everybody can go in the right direction. Most corporations now, certainly in the, in the UK and I'm, I'm sure in other parts of the world, um, have green credentials uh, and you can see um, what their corporate um, water zero plan is for not removing water from a catchment. Um, and this is the kind of thing that can show up on their balance sheet of improving catchments uh, and adding value to that. Thank you. Brilliant. So I, yeah, I've got a, a burning question for you, Tom, as well, but I'm, I'm going to save it for later. I think I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a hint, though. I'm trying to work out how I could finance 
uh, this? Uh, how could we, how could like private companies basically get investment so that they could go after others? Uh, that's what I'm going to ask, but I'm not going to do that now. I thought I should say, um, Laura noticed um, on the sign up page that it said 60 minutes. Um, so this actually is a 90 minute um, round table. So I, I'm sure we'll be able to easily discuss things for 90 minutes. So if you thought this was 60 minutes, now is the time to send apologies for your next meeting and say that you've got to stay for the full 90. Um, but um, Aaron's also telling me that the next topic people want to discuss is making big oil pay. So um, Tom, I'm presuming there also haven't been any specific questions from you. I don't know if there's a Q&A box. I can't find the Q&A box. Uh, there probably isn't. Um, so yeah, just hands up people um, for questions for Tom. Uh, not even questions, it could be suggestions. You might have a better idea. Tom might not be going far enough. Sorry, um, ben, ben, might not be. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, it's not like I don't know you. <laughs> I've got a question for Ben. <laughs> okay, excellent. On you go, Tom. <laughs> okay, um, so... Um... I, I I love the 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 idea, uh, Ben, and I think this is a is, is a great uh, way to go. Um, but I do see challenges uh, across geographies. Um, how is this uh, enforceable um, for people outside, or organisations, companies outside the state of Vermont and and, and in different geographies? Um, is it based on their sales in, in Vermont or is it? Uh... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the yeah, so the reality is there's a whole host of, you know, of the dozens of uh, corporations that have emitted more than a billion tons between 1995 and the end of this year. Uh, most of them don't have any connection to Vermont. And so, you know, in the United States, there's this concept of there being a, a legal nexus between a jurisdiction and an entity it's trying to um, impose a law of some kind on. Um, and so, you know, there's a there's a legal test. I am not an attorney. I won't try to describe it in, in any kind of detail, but essentially if there's a, a legal or physical connection, so if they have, you know, corporate registrations in the state, if they're selling into the state, if they have gas stations in the state, that sort of thing, then there's enough of a connection that, um, you can draw this line and we could issue the cost recovery demand. Uh, as part of the process, the agency and natural resources is gonna to have to make a determination of you know, what entities are in there. Um, and so most, frankly, of the um, emissions in the world won't be captured by our particular program in, in our small state, which means you know, Vermonters are still gonna be on the hook for the vast majority of the cost of the climate crisis. Um, if you're talking about a you know larger jurisdiction, if this were done at the national level, obviously the United States would be able to reach a you know much more significant number of companies, and you know a greater percentage of total global emissions would be uh, accounted for in the program. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and do you see a, a, a mechanism? Uh, coming in in the future um and you know this is obviously uh there's going to be challenges with different states in in the us uh of this getting to a, to a national level well there actually was a uh, bill introduced uh just under a month ago uh at the federal level um led by uh, senator van holland from maryland and uh, senator Sanders uh, from here in Vermont, along with a number of other um, representatives and senators, including the rest of the Vermont delegation in, in Washington, D.C. Um, it would, you know, apply a similar principle at the national level, uh, would collect a trillion dollars over the next 10 years uh, from uh, dozens of companies, which, you know, again, a much larger number than we're able to reach. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in November. I don't know if that will be able to pass this coming uh, legislative uh, session in the next Congress, but we certainly hope so. And, you know, we're seeing this bubble up more and more places around uh, the country. So I think not unlike other climate actions where there, with the Inflation Reduction Act, has been substantial progress at the federal level, despite all of the 
um, you know, best efforts of the fossil fuel industry. We're optimistic that ultimately this will happen at the national level, um, though I won't try to predict exactly when. Well, we've got a question from Dan as well. Yeah, I, I think it's just more to keep the, uh, I am quite ignorant in this space. So um, I just want to understand the, the intent of this fund is to recover costs. That's, a, the, it's a cost recovery fund. And the costs are actual costs incurred that can be attributed to, to climate change events or as a result of climate change. And in this case, is it all that cost is then only um, um, targeted, the recovery is only targeted at um, uh, carbon emitting com uh, uh, companies that can be associated with carbon emissions. Yeah, that's right. So the spe specific language in Vermont's law uh, has it covering companies that were in the business of extracting or refining fossil fuels over that 30 year time period I mentioned. Um, and then, yes, it, you know, it's a cost recovery program. The cost estimate I mentioned is mm -hmm. uh, supposed to include, it is required to include uh, sort of for what I would describe as sort of four sets of costs, um, historic costs during that 30 year period that were either from resilience or ad adaptation or response uh, investments we had to make, uh, you know, bridges built to a higher standard, or um, we got hit really badly by tropical storm Irene about a decade ago, and Vermont paid a lot to, you know, Vermont residents to recover from that. So those sorts of costs going uh, back in time, and then an estimate of it going forward. Um, and then similarly, uh, the direct damage done to the state in terms of, you know, put into a dollar figure historically during that 30 year period and going forward. Um, and then, you know, it would be each company covered would pay a amount proportional to their pollution during that 30 year period of that, you know, overarching cost number. Okay. And then a follow-up question would be, I mean, um, this appears to be quite a, uh, a legislative, a litigative process that one that the state is intending to pursue. I mean, what it, it, with the laws passed in the state, that does the state would still need to follow le, um, a litigative process to actually recover the costs? So I had, hope. It, go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, no, no. Well, not to my knowledge, but I don't foresee any big oil company um, forking out the money on their own free will. <laughs> Uh, that's a fair uh, point. I've said similar sentences myself. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of points on litigation. Obviously, they have the uh, legal right to challenge the law and say, we don't think you can do this for whatever you know constitutional reason, or we think it's preempted by federal law. Um, they've uh, put a, uh, out a memo. There's all the reasons we don't think this is this is going to fly in the courts. That's the right. They can do that. They haven't done it yet. Um, but again, we feel like we have very strong arguments that it, it would actually be upheld. If it is upheld, then there's sort of another level of the sort of legal questions, which is, I think, what you're more getting to, which is, OK, so you issue the cost recovery demand and they say, we don't feel like it. We're not going to give you the money. Then what? There obviously would be a, a path through the courts to uh, require them to actually comply with Vermont law um, that we hope we don't have to avail ourselves of if the you know the courts ultimately say the um the law actually does stand up on its face um is you know legal and constitutional move forward but if we have to ultimately avail ourselves of um you know the courts to get the money in the door then that's what the state would have to do and i i should say um you know one other point that's sort of adjacent to what you're talking about um you know, going into this, the Vermont legislature was very clear about, partly because it's a multi-year process just to implement the law, and partly because there's probably, there's a high likelihood there's going to be a, a, at least several additional years added to the timeline because of those legal challenges we were just talking about. Now, this really is a medium to long-term uh, funding solution that there's a whole lot we need to do now. There's other laws that Vermont's passed, um, other funding that it's put in uh, the mix on climate resilience and response 
already. Um, but even though it might not be, it'll be years before this money comes in, it's really important we get the ball rolling now um, because if we don't do that, then the money's never going to come. Well, I think it's me next. Um, I yeah, I absolutely love it. I think it's is brilliant. Um, personally, I think while you said it's it's about funding that adaptation rather than mitigation, I think this is going to do a lot on mitigation because I think if people start seeing that they're going to have to pay for the the damage, then they're going to start try to work out how to not pay and the the obvious way in my opinion is to leave it in the ground um but i'm hoping we don't have anyone from big oil watching at the moment um although i imagine they'd have thought of this anyway but i'm thinking if i was um was digging up oil and 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 selling it um i would probably be saying well i i thought you guys were going to make plastic out of it and other petrochemicals and stuff like that i had no clue that you were going to burn it in your cars um so surely the people who are producing the carbon dioxide are all your suv drivers in in vermont and it should be them who should be paying rather than us we were just providing a feedstock yeah let me go to that that second part uh first so yeah, that's certainly an argument that was raised. Uh, you know, our counter argument on that would be simply that, you know, they were fairly compensated for these companies were compensated and made uh, some very significant profits, obviously, to the tune of trillions of dollars over that 30 year period um, for the uh, fossil fuels that they were putting in the market. Um, and so they are the ones that are the uh, logical uh and appropriate um ones to actually pay you know they are they are ultimately the sort of root of the problem i mean you know we were talking about radical solutions and ultimately radical means to get to the root of something and that is in fact what we were trying to do here it's when you take the fossil fuels out of the ground that really is the, the root of the problem um on plastics i'll just note that the law is very clear that this is um the the greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the um the extraction and refining of fossil fuels and so you know in the implementation of it you would have to back out um there's some percentage of fossil fuels that are extracted but not combusted um i believe the number is around 10 percent globally over that period and so uh that would be sort of subtracted in the the process of implementing this from the total amount of fossil fuels that are um being extracted uh and so you know wouldn't be damaging the climate if you're talking about you know them turning into plastics all sorts of other problems with plastics but not exactly the same problems i also feel i feel like there was one question you mentioned at the beginning that i'm uh blanking oh, on it? yeah no I, I think yeah this will do brilliant things for mitigation because i think when people oh, start right. to realize they're going to be sued they're going to stop producing as much well i would i just said that uh, i'd say two things quickly one yeah, obviously, that's not the, the goal of the um, program. You know, there are carbon pricing schemes, cap and invest programs that we've supported in the past and probably will again in the future that are really about that. That's not what this is. I will say one thing on mitigation, though, which is just um, because there, you know, if you're talking about a, a Venn diagram of uh, mitigation investments and resilience investments, there's overlap there. You know, in particular around extreme heat, there are a lot of things you'd want to do, like weatherize homes and invest in you know, super efficient HVAC systems or heat pumps uh, that will make homes and businesses and schools more resilient in the face of higher average temperatures and more extreme heat. That will also have the effect of reducing carbon pollution in the heating sector during the colder months. Um, and those sorts of things would certainly be eligible because they're also resilience investments. Cool, yeah. Well, Tom's next, I think. Yeah, hi Ben. Um, I was just sort of following on from in that thought process uh, about uh, about plastics and, and microplastics and whether it would apply to to that. But the other um, big problem that we have, uh, certainly in the UK, where we have quite a, a, a dense population, um, and in our rivers, is pharmaceuticals um, and 
could you imagine the same kind of principle uh, being applied to big pharma, uh, of, uh, <laughs> where those pharmaceuticals go in our rivers and uh, and what happens to them? It's a great question, not one I've really contemplated before. I mean, I will say the polluters pay principle generally, uh, I think, is at least in the United States, mostly been applied to, um, you know, toxic waste and and uh, concentrated uh, points of pollution. But I think it's entirely appropriate to consider it in other contexts like the climate crisis and, you know, maybe beyond that. Uh, but I, I haven't contemplated that particular uh, idea. Excellent. Right. So, uh, sorry, were you saying something I, else? I was just saying thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ben. <laughs> cool. Very polite. Um, so, yeah, next, Cynthia, who's got questions uh, for Cynthia? To me, the radical thing here. Um, in fact, Cynthia, are you still with us? I can't see you. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, who's first to ask a question here? To me, the most radical thing is, if I've understood it correctly, is that if someone is not connecting to your sewerage, you're going to pay them, you're going to charge them even more than if they are connecting to the sewerage and receiving a service. Is that right? Yes, because he's polluting and we base it our tariff system in a cross subsidy so, so the, the tariff should be sustainable considering all users. So, and this is pretty common in Brazil. People don't want to connect to the system. So it's a big problem. Hmm. So hands up, uh, who wants to ask the next question here? Uh, hi, Cynthia. So uh, I must apologize. I did not um, attend your presentation. I joined a bit late. Um, so I am actually coming blind in terms of the context in, in which you operated. Um, but I want to understand for the systems, uh, sanitation systems that you do have, do you have non sewage sanitation? So that's not connected, um, so that residents are using? And if so, um, are those serviced? Yes, we have all kinds of systems in Brazil, but we are mainly working with uh, sanitation pipette systems. And this is our primarily, uh, it's very important because we have concessions here, even public concessions or private companies working. So they have the concession of the whole area. So they, when they are expanding the cover, they consider in their revenue, uh, they will collect a tariff from all the users. So we have a problem of sustainability for the, the revenue. Uh, so we need that all user uh, should be in the, in, the, in the system. So we could have uh, social tariff, and we could spend the system and have the, the coverage for all the users. So we have in in rural areas fast few systems, but it's 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 an exception. It's not the rule in Brazil. I don't know if I answered you. Uh, I think you have. So I mean, uh, why why can't there be a different um, tariff model for people who opt We're not, not to? Yeah, we're not connected. Yes, because we are considering that if they are not connecting, they are polluting the, the environment. So this is a big issue here now. We have a uh, huge availability of water, but we are decreasing the quality, ver quality very fast, especially in urban air areas. So... Um, and two points. So yeah. if the, the, they are not connected to the system, they are polluting. So we we will charge, we charge all the user for the availability of the system. If, if they are not connected, they will pay the tariff plus a fine. So we will discourage in practice that could harm the environment and especially public health. So this is the main point. 
Okay. Well, thank you. So I, yeah, I've got a follow up question on that. Um, I guess if let's say I have um, reed beds and stuff like that, I've I've got good uh, tertiary, excellent treatment. Uh, I'm a water engineer. Um, I've got a a, a good system. Um, sorry, I'm just getting confused by the automatic hand removal system, uh, which is a good idea. Um, but yeah, so let's say on my premises, I'm already treating to the national standards. Do I still have to pay uh, or is there a, a system by which I can get an exemption? Okay, so we have a few exceptions. Uh, we could have this alternative system with fossil fuel with the best uh, technical um, target. So what will happen is that so we have uh, a federal level uh, regulation and then we the exception is if the international subnational agency agency consider that in this area it is some the solution passed through uh, this alternative, what we call alternative solution with a fossil fuel uh, technological system that could address the problem. If the, the, the subnational regulatory agency consider this is something that will address the problem and they, they, they have, if this is a good technique, technique so it's could be a possible solution, but the sub subnational regulatory agencies should agree with this solution. Cool. Um, I've also seen in the chat, Cecilia um, has a comment. Cecilia, do you want to come on camera and unmute and bring it yourself, or would you prefer that I read it? No, that, that's okay. Thank you. I, I was commenting about the who discharge effluence in Peru needs to pay a fee for the discharge, but it's, <laughs> it should be treated water and mainly directed to the industries. I mean, I mean mining industry and oil industry who discharge the treated effluent. But um, it's difficult to implement for the cities because the small cities, the small towns in the countryside doesn't have an effective collection uh, system for the sewage. So we have kind of control into the to the industry, but not other cities. And in the industry, we are on the mercy of their monitoring. The government can't not, if in the day-to-day, -day they add more than the concentration they are allowed. If they are allowed to 100, I mean, whatever the, the level is, it, it is, they need to demonstrate it only for a monthly monitoring provided by themselves. And well, in the next, in the other 29 days, no, nobody is controlling, only it's possible to control in the, the one day that they take the monitoring. Uh, and the governments are not taking controls frequently on the, on the receptor, no? the, 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 the body water that is receiving the, the pollutants. So in the paper, it's okay, it's working, but in day to day, it's difficult to control uh, given the difficult geography that we have and the big industries are, the, the our main industry is the mining and the mining is in the highlands and in the countryside. We expect they work well, they have standards, I mean, the big miner, miners, but the small ones or the informal or illegals, uh, difficult to control and difficult they, they are in. This is a good point just to comment. And it happens in Brazil too, because we we will charge the not just the residential users, the households, but the industry, commercial, commercial users. So they all should pay for the availability of the system. And in Brazil, the crop the that the industry pays much more than the residential users. But this is something that is very challenging because in the countryside, we we really have a problem as in Peru. 
it's difficult to monitor. We've also got some um, questions from Kabina. Kabina, do you want to? And sorry, I'm probably getting everyone's names wrong. Um, pronunciation. Um, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to find out. Um, I'm not sure if, if the questions have been touched on already. So um, I just wanted to find out what, what the scope of the policy is. I think the, the PPP policy, what is it? What is the scope of the policy? And uh, is it globally binding or is it just limited to a certain um, region? Also, um, so there are three in one question, sorry. <laughs> Should we do them uh, one at a time? Because that'll be easier to answer. Okay, um, okay. So, sorry, is that a question specifically for Cynthia or is that for all of us? So for all of you, I don't know who would like to touch on it. Um, If... Yep, yeah, anyone put your hand up if you want to respond. Otherwise, I will try. Then I will try. So, yeah, I think we've got there's three main things that we've been talking about so far today in terms of polluters pay, polluter pays. And I would like to know if anyone has any other ideas as well. So please do mention those in the chat at least um, and, and we can get to those shortly. Um, but yeah, first up, uh, we had Cynthia and... I, I would say, yeah, that Cynthia is the, the reg regulator um, for one country. So the scope of that is a single country. I think it's a really good idea, though, um, to make people. So the, the concept is that if you're not if you have the availability um, of public sewerage collection and you're not using that and instead you're just discharging to the environment, I think you should definitely pay more. Uh, I think it would be for national governments to implement that. Uh, or perhaps even, I mean, that was discussed a lot at, at the start. You you can watch the recording if you want for more details on, on the specifics there, but it might be local or it might be national, but I think it would, it would probably be hard to make that uh, globally binding um, at the moment um, until, I, I don't know, at least we had a majority of countries doing it. Um, okay. Then we had Tom's ideas. So Tom, I think with his ideas and Tom, Please do interject. Um, I I think those are basically based on national legal frameworks as well. So Tom gave examples of the UK and the US and how these things might work in each of those. I think, again, it's probably going to have to be a national thing. Um, Ben's, uh, as, as I understand, is currently limited to one state, but he's hoping it's going to go for the whole of the US. And I would very much hope that the rest of the world also tags on because, well, frankly, if if it's something that can be done, um, we would be stupid not doing it. Uh, particularly, yeah, countries that are small island states are about to go underwater and so on. And people who uh, countries who have lots of people dying because of climate change, I think absolutely should be charging the fossil industry um, for the adaptation measures that they require. Anyone want to comment further on that? Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, a, a lot of things uh, require sort of uh, national action. And, and mainly that's because our legal framework is on a national level. So uh, if you can take it to the highest court in the land, um, whatever you're doing, that's... Uh, um, that's where the challenges are, are going to get to. Um, but uh, um, there needn't, uh, with certainly river monitoring, um, there needn't be implemented on a national level. Certainly, uh, we're starting with our most sensitive catchments in the U UK with our nutrient management boards. Um, so on a catchment level, certainly it's uh, possible to apply that uh, regulation uh, and then see how that goes and and how successful it is uh just as it's possible to start charging on uh, one particular road uh and and charging people to to drive on that road um you can start with one and, and start small uh, and, and build up from there um but of course you know uh everything is comes down to a national level when that's the way that our courts work 
Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. Your second question. Yeah, my second question. Okay, so the third question was somehow um answered in it's it's a follow up to the first question actually. So some way somehow you may have um answered it, but my second question is um with regards to uh so I think one of the questions you um uh, one of the topics for discussion during the poll was about um river water quality, and uh. This question also is in relation to that, in the sense that in some African countries, um, the polluters are unscrupulous individuals who are engaging in mining and other um, illegal activities in water bodies or near water bodies that tend to more uh, destroy these water bodies in terms of their quality for um, water treatment. And some of them are also being backed by high-ranking uh, people in the society. So with regards to um, this policy document, how do you enforce it in areas where uh, getting even in touch with those who are actually perpetrating this crime are hardly to come by or they are, these people are, are heavily armed? So how are you able to enforce this policy in these areas? I don't know if you understand the question I'm asking. I, I understand the, the, the question, Kobe. Yeah, and, uh, and it's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I think there's one part of it is um, uh, how do you enforce any law uh, when uh, the people don't want to um, uh, obey it uh, in, in in that place, and how does one individual uh, have the power to do so? But um, I can certainly give you good examples of um, where this has been enforced and where some of those things might uh, uh, come back. Um, so uh, in um, parts of Asia, uh, particularly in, in, in China, um, there was a, a series of um, incidents uh, that um, pushed uh, Jack Wang uh, several years ago to set up a um, an app uh, about reporting river pollution. Um, so it was taking photos with your mobile phone um, and geotagging uh, those photos uh, so that the those that were polluting were were caught. Um, and this pushed big international companies to require um, real-time monitoring on all their international sites because they wanted to protect their reputation. Um, and when it comes to, to mining, for example, uh, many of those mining companies are listed on the, the London stock exchanges or um, maybe in New York or, or Vancouver or wherever their, their international headquarters are. Uh, but certainly in, in the UK, um, the international mining companies are, are well represented, um, and then the the fines were levied uh, at uh, the the international courts uh, for damages done locally, um, pushing mining companies to clean up their act uh, in parts of the world that didn't necessarily have the legislation on their books, um, and with Earth observation technologies and satellite monitoring alongside. Um, cheap handheld uh, mobile phone technologies you have a, uh, a virtuous loop where you have a feedback loop so you can pick up things at satellite level uh, you can match that with uh, data scrapes on the ground uh, through um, mobile phone photos uh, and um, cod monitoring heavy metal monitoring uh, with geotags uh, and and track the the, the pollution um, so you're getting the the, the crimes uh, been reported um, to the essentially to the head offices uh, of some of these mining organisations. Now that doesn't give uh, legislation across the entire globe. Uh, you know, nobody is the the global policeman on these things. Uh, but certainly, um, if you can affect the shareholding uh, of a company, uh, that is uh, certainly just as serious as. Uh, um uh, as a, a maybe a local criminal fine might be mm. and just before handing over to Raphael um I would also point out that yeah it's it's not 
just Africa or um, the UK. Um, yeah, I think I think we have exactly the same issue. I think we've got very powerful um, people um, high up in government and other places that are basically the reason that we have as much river pollution as we have. Um, and I, yeah, because be treating this like like traffic cameras why why would we not you know th there's obviously something there i don't think any individuals um are in favor of river pollution and yet yeah we we have all these speed cameras enforcing the speed limit but we don't have anywhere yeah we, <laughs> what was it for you said river water quality monitoring stations so there's there's somebody high up there who's who's trying to stop this and that sounds like i'm a conspiracy theorist but yeah anyway but it, <laughs> it's it's, it, it, it's it's part of this discussion uh where we spend a, a lot of time investing in technologies to um flag down um you know just a serious crimes from individuals but not necessarily from uh our corporations um and legally we should be all equal in, in the law uh whether you're a corporation or an individual uh that's polluting um i don't think there should be free passes for either yeah yeah and rafael yeah can you hear me yes okay yeah thank you and uh you have actually um answered the question i wanted to ask and uh, with uh, regards to the people in high rank positions in government sectors that back these um, unscrupulous individuals to um, engage in the illegal activities which tends to pollute our water body. So um, it becomes challenging for uh, the citizens or those who are against it to um, fish them out for proper prosecution because um, they are being backed by the law that is supposed to protect these um, river bodies. So I just want to ask that, how about individuals, those uh, who are being backed by the government or higher authorities, and then you have already answered it, yeah. Thank you. And that is actually the challenge we are facing in um, this part of the world in Africa, because you would clearly see that um, they are actively engaged in this activities that tend to affect the water quality, the river quality, but yet um, for you to be able to get a foothold on them that um, their activity is actually um, endangering the environment, they are being backed by um, these powerful individuals in court to continue perpetrating their illegal activities. So it becomes um, challenging for uh, the policies or the laws to be enforced. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we've got what uh, just over four minutes still to go. So please, um, absolute open house. Any questions, any anything, any suggestions, even in fact, any other ideas for polluter pays that we should be considering, please put your hand up now. Um, also, please do uh, join the specialist group on sustainability in the water sector. Um, you can follow this QR code. Um, but yes, who's next? Other questions? Kobe. You are still muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for answering the questions. Yeah, so I, I also want to find out, um, I don't know, maybe you may have um, touched on it already whether the policy document is um, readily accessible or it is it must be an iowa member before you be able to uh, assess this document uh, so um there is not yet a policy document and i th i'm not sure i think maybe the one you're referring to is just the write-up of our discussion today which carlos is going to be doing i i think I think you probably do need to be an Iowa member um, because I think you need to join the specialist group on sustainability in the water sector in order to receive that. Um, but I will advocate for the idea that we 
we get something out there that that everyone can access. Um, so we'll definitely raise that at the next climate working group meeting. Again, I think to be a member of the climate working group, you, um, I think you need to be a member of Iowa. But um, feel free to, yeah, email me um, my LinkedIn or send me a LinkedIn connection request or something. Mention mention this, and I'll ensure that uh, the chair gets gets all this. Um, okay, any other questions? My big question that I wanted to ask Tom, and maybe everyone can possibly answer this, um, was, yeah, how can, if, if the laws already exist for this, how can we set up charities or private companies? Um, and basically, it's going to cost a lot of money to sue companies, uh, lots of le legal fees, etc. Also, the monitoring that we need to do to gather all the evidence to get a watertight case. Um, we need to therefore be able to recoup that money and uh, in order to incentivize people to do it, we need to be able to make a bit of profit on it. Is there a way um, that we can we can do that? Um, what does everyone think? And Tom's had most time to think about it, so Tom first. <laughs> yeah, so um, <clears throat> all, all these things um, and, you know, everything we, we do, because uh, this is, uh, part politics, right? Um, require transparency and 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 data. Uh, and uh, when you have transparency and and, and data, uh, that uh, really helps a any case uh, because you can discuss with the the wider public uh, about what they want to do uh, around an issue, um, rather than uh, an individual having the uh, the force of law behind them. And um, uh, part of what we uh, certainly have in, in the UK uh, is uh, thousands and thousands of people um, collecting information and data on our rivers, um, just volunteers uh, out there uh, running samples, running uh, tests, doing uh, mayfly tests, water quality tests uh, every single day uh, and sharing that in the, in the public domain. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this can range from very basic tests, very cheap tests to, to very expensive lab based uh, um, quality equipment and some of which I showed earlier. So that gives baselines, gives data and gives information that uh, the, the public can, can work with. Um, if uh, a, a, a company... Um, think... Sorry, we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> but I think that's we are, didn't we are, give you a time limit. <laughs> I didn't give you a time limit. No. Yeah, we're Carlos is has kindly volunteered to write this discussion up in a newsletter article. Um so we'll hopefully get some conclusions there. Uh but you will need to be a member of the specialist group on sustainability in the water sector to get a copy of that. Uh so you can sign up here. I think Aaron will pop the uh, link into the chat again. And also, if you'd like to help Carlos develop the conclusions uh, in our article, please do let him know via the chat, I think. Um, and you can join, yeah, join the specialist group using this QR code. Um, I particularly also invite you to join our climate working group. Uh, that's a new working group that was responsible for this event. First of many, hopefully. Um, I mentioned at the start that the water climate discussion is a much bigger initiative than just this round table. Uh, so the LinkedIn discussion is particularly important uh, because it's where we'd like you to think of and post ideas for radical change. And the reason I say it's particularly important is that the people that we've got here, I imagine we're already sort of signed up. We, we recognise the issues of climate change and we really want to do something about them. Um, I'm thinking if we can draw more people into the discussion, uh, people who are perhaps less excited about um, fixing the climate crisis than we are, that would be really useful. Um, so, yeah, with those, Jo Burgess, as I said before, she brought the first one. Um, and, yeah, it was on marine cloud brightening. Def but it might be something that we're forced to consider um, if all else fails. Um, Piers Clark's post on composting toilets has generated yet yeah, so much discussion. It's 
clearly an uncomfortable suggestion for the water sector uh, because we're quite happy doing what we we do. We take wastewater and we treat it. Um, if we had to take solid waste instead, that all gets very scary and weird. Um, but yeah, the amount of debate that it's caused is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, my proposal, yeah, a bit more frivolous, but um, yeah, I, I think it's a case of, yeah, should we cut back on everything or if we're going to get great ideas in the bath or perhaps, you know, using AI um, takes takes quite a lot of energy as well. Um, but are we going to get better ideas that way? Um, so anyway, please do head to waterclimatediscussion.com. Uh, you can snap this QR code. Um, Aaron's hopefully going to get that. Oh, it's already in there. Um, in the, the chat, it's brilliant. So you can sign up for other roundtables there. Um, so there are also some, um, yeah, so the instructions on how to post your suggestion for radical change. And there's other events in this series that um, you may want to sign up for. Um, in addition to the Institute of uh, Environmental Sciences Foundation for Water Research, we're doing a similar roundtable on reverse water cycles on the 31st. There are other stealth mode events that are so radical that we can't publish them yet. Um, so head back next week and we'll hopefully have posted some uh, updates. So yeah. Hey Siri, remind me to check uh, all one word, waterclimatediscussion.com uh, this time next week. Example of AI, let's see if that works. Okay. I added it. Yeah, okay. You almost added it, it's discussion.com. But anyway, it's close enough. Um, so your next steps, basically, if you've got an idea for radical change that you'd like to discuss with others, something we discussed today or something completely different, um, please, yeah, head there and uh, that will give you instructions on how to post your video to LinkedIn so that we can all share it and add comments. Uh, basically, uh, there's the instructions. Basically, um, grab your phone, record your idea as a video on your phone, uh, post it to LinkedIn uh, with the hashtag radical change and at water climate discussion. Um, and Erin can let us know in the chat if there's any extra hashtags or uh, mentions that we should be putting in there. Uh, but if you do that, if in particularly important, if you at mention at water space climate space discussion, um, then we'll be able to see those. We'll be able to share them with everyone else and we'll all be able to share these ideas. Um, and then, yeah, please do comment on everyone else's ideas. Uh, we'll also post them on the website. Oh so, yeah, thank you um, everyone so much for this. Um, particularly uh, Cynthia, um, Tom and Ben for preparing those excellent presentations. Um, for Carlos, who put a lot of work along with the uh, other members of the um, the climate working group um, over the summer to put this all together. Um, and Carlos also, who's going to be doing an awful lot work, more work now as he writes this up for the newsletter. Um, thanks also to Erin for putting in so much work to make this all happen. Uh, it's brilliant. And for everyone who joined us, we'll see you at the next one. Um, do yeah, check out the waterclimatediscussion.com site. Um, and yeah, have a look this time next week because there's going to be more events and other things added there as well as we approach COP29.